Thank you very much for the introduction and the, in and the invitation to come and speak to you today. So what um, I'm going to do is, is essentially talk about our gene identification studies, but concentrate on those that related to autosomal recessive disorders. And this has been a particular interest to us because we know that the risk of autosomal recessive disorders is increased within some ethnic groups and also by consanguinity. And within the UK, and particularly around where I'm based for the past 14 years in, in Birmingham, there are some communities with a high degree of consanguinity, and that has been associated with high frequency of rare autosomal recessive disorders in the population, such as my late colleague, Professor Sarah Bundy, estimated that there was a one in 10 risk of serious inherited disorder in children born to consanguineous unions. So for us, the motivation to study these pet, uh, families was first of all to see if we could use genomic techniques to improve the management of them, but also because of the availability of the powerful technique of autosagosty mapping, uh, we could actually use these families to identify disease genes that might otherwise be extremely difficult to identify. So the principle of autosagosty mapping is based on the fact that if we have consanguinity, then the affected individuals down here are likely to be homozygous for the mutation inherited from their common ancestor. And in addition to being homozygous for the mutation, they'll also be homozygous for a number of polymorphic, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms or microsatellite markers in the vicinity of the disease gene. So our approach to studying these families is first of all to be to ascertain uh, suitable families to carefully verify the phenotype, make sure that the uh, clinical phenotype has been well defined and is robust. And to do that, some years ago, we set up a collaboration between ourselves in Birmingham and uh, colleagues in Leeds, uh, at the time, Bob Muller and Jeff Woods, and Richard Trembath, who was then in Leicester. And the idea was to try and bank DNA from consanguineous families with autosomal recessive disorders for which there was no known gene. And that's a quite a broad remit, and that's been one of the strengths of the proposal, in that we haven't focused on a sp particular phenotype, but we've tried to bank DNA from those families where we thought it was going to be feasible to undertake uh, gene identification studies. So having obtained DNA samples from the appropriate families, we then undertake whole genome mapping studies. Initially, this was with microsatellite markers, and then we moved on to single nucleotide polymorphism, uh, microarrays, starting off with uh, 10,000 SNP arrays, 50,000 SNP arrays, 250,000 SNP arrays, and then more recently, uh, 500,000 SNP arrays. And then, okay. and so, Essentially, our approach, when having typed individual affected members of the family, is to identify areas of homozygosity that extend for at least two megabases of, of DNA. And the uh, power of this approach is that we can get as much genetic information from a, a single affected child from a consanguineous union as we can from three affected children from a non-consanguineous family. Having identified areas of homozygosity, we then use microsatellite markers mapping to within the homozygous regions to study the whole family and to see whether we have got autozygosity by descent or whether perhaps the, the single nucleotide polymorphisms have been uh, uninformative. And then having identified a region, we then go on to undertake mutation analysis of candidate genes within the target interval. So this is a standardized, relatively straightforward approach, but using this strategy, we've been able to identify genes for a large numbers of uh, genetic disorders, which are uh, listed here. So what I'm going to do is just take some of the, these disorders as examples of the various aspects of 
the work we're doing in, in gene identification and hopefully demonstrate how we're moving towards being able to identify genes in smaller and smaller families at a faster and faster rate. So to start off the uh, description of individual conditions with a study that we undertook on a large family with uh, pediatric neurodegenerative disorder uh, known as neuronal brain iron accumulation. And this is actually a group of disorders. At the time, the best characterized example of it were those families who'd been diagnosed with a disease formerly known as Haraborn Spatz disease and had germline mutations in, in PANC2. So these were homozygous or compound heterozygous patients with mutations in this gene uh, and having an autosomal recessive disorder. There were a group of patients with MBIA in whom a, a PAN2 mutation was not detected. And an old family uh, was referred to us as being uh, from this group. But there were also related disorders, in particular infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy and Carax syndrome, where the phenotype overlapped uh, with the uh, MBIA without PAN2 mutation. So this is the family that was referred to. We were very excited at the time when we had this family because it was clearly extensive with multiple affected individuals and therefore likely to be very powerful for gene mapping studies. So we undertook our studies as I've uh, described. Um, on chromosome 22, we identified a critical interval that was shared by all affected members of the family who were homozygous for this region. And this was about five, just under five megabases. Now what was challenging was that within this region there were about 100 genes. And certainly after we uh, sequenced the uh, first few genes, we became to be quite downhearted as to how we were going to identify the, tick, the gene of interest because there didn't seem to be any obvious candidate genes within that region. So we contacted uh, Professor Susan Hayflick in the United States who described the identification of the PANC2 gene and asked whether she had additional families. And coincidentally, she'd been working in the same area with some of her families with uh, whom she made a diagnosis of infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy. And when we reviewed the diagnosis in our family, it seemed that the phenotype of her families and ours was very similar. However, unfortunately, al although we put together the data on five uh, families, we were still left with a very large region and weren't able to reduce the region. So at that time, we split the region in half. Susan and her group started sequencing uh, genes in this half of the region, and we started sequencing genes in that half of the region. And we gradually undertook Sanger sequencing and, and went through them. And we worked to about 60 genes when we identified mutations in PLA2G6. And having identified mutations initially in our family in Birmingham, we were then able to extend the analysis, and uh, Susan had a, a large bank of uh, similar families, and we eventually published results of uh, homozygous and compound heterozygous mutations in about 40 families. And you can see from here there were a wide range of uh, mutations. And many of these were private to individual families. So what is this gene? Well, it encodes a calcium-independent phospholipase A2 that's uh, involved in the hydrolysis of uh, glycerophospholipids. The function of the uh, gene product is, is not that well uh, established, but it is known to be critical for maintaining cell membrane homeostasis, and therefore we believe that in some way uh, this defective cell membrane homeostasis is uh, critical to the pathogenesis of the neurodegeneration observed in this uh, disorder. However, the precise mechanism by which this happens is still to be fully elucidated. Now, when we, you have a new gene, you can go back and undertake a genetic diagnosis. And so we did that for our families locally who had neural brain ion accumulation. And we actually found a very homogeneous phenotype uh, that was characterized by relatively normal development until age two years of age, and then evidence of psychomotor uh, regression after that. MRI showed a cerebellar uh, atrophy. And there was an inexorable downward progression, such that the children usually died 
uh, by the age of uh, 13 or 14 years. So a very severe neurodegenerative disorder. However, when you have a genetic uh, test, you can then find that there are other disorders that are allelic to it, and indeed that's what happened. We found that, for example, Karak syndrome, which had been described as a separate disorder, turned out to be uh, caused by mutations in PLA2G6. So, somewhat surprisingly then, we noted a report from London of a family with early onset dystonia Parkinsonism, where individuals uh, uh, developed an autosomal recessively inherited form of dystonic Parkinsonism presenting in, in young adults. And this was mapped and found to be caused by mutations in the PLA2G6 gene. So this expanded the range of phenotypes that can be associated with mutations in this gene, such that we now talk about PLAN or PLA2G6 associated neurodegeneration being really a, a spectrum of disorders. Now sometimes uh, genotype phenotype correlations can be undertaken and these can provide critical insights into gene function and structure function correlations. And you can see a paper here from Engel et al who investigated the functional effects of the mutations in PLA2G6 that cause the early onset disorder that we've described and this milder later onset disorder and they were able to demonstrate that the mutations associated with the infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy impair, uh, obliterated the uh, enzymatic activity of PLA2G6, but this was not seen with mutations that caused the dystonia Parkinsonism phenotype. So, now I want to move to a, another disorder that we've been working on, again with a neuro, uh, neurological interest. And this was uh, multiple pterygium syndrome. So this again is a heterogeneous group of disorders. Clinically, it's characterized by arthrogyposis. You can see the joint contractures here. And pterygia or webbing across the joints. See, here's an example of a pterygia web across the elbow. And here's another one, a neck uh, web here. Now this is classically divided into two types a pre- or, or perinatal lethal form known as lethal multiple pterygium syndrome and a non-lethal form known as Escobar multiple pterygium syndrome. And the various types of multiple pterygium syndrome can be inherited in different ways including autosomal dominant and X-linked but the majority are inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. And our introduction to this disorder was when we ascertained this large consanguineous family which, which constantly came from, from Saudi Arabia and we were able to obtain samples from them and undertake a genome-wide SNP analysis. As I've described, we identified homozygous regions and then we used microsatellite markers uh, to type the family further and we found a significant lot score within the family at uh, a region on chromosome 2. We also had a second family from the UK, which was smaller, but when we typed it with the same markers, we found that that also had evidence of homozygosity and linkage in the same region as identified in the, in the large family. So this gave us a 7 megabeta candidate region, and there were 64 genes within this region. But in this particular case, we were able to have a, a good idea of what sort of gene we were looking for. And we were particularly interested in two uh, muscle genes, namely CHRND and CHRNG. So what do these genes do? Well, they both encode subunits of the acetylcholine receptor. And there are actually two forms of the acetylcholine receptor. There's an adult form, which is found in uh, innervated uh, muscle. And an embryonic form, which as you would expect, is, is, is found in, in the fetus, but also in, in denervated muscle. Now, the two uh, forms of acetylcholine receptor actually d just differ according to the presence of a single uh, component uh, protein. So in the embryonic subunit, we have a gamma subunit, whereas in the adult version, we have an epsilon uh, subunit. And the switch from embryonal to 
adult acetylcholine receptor takes place in humans about 28 weeks.